So there are two types of repentance that we see, uh, St. Peter and St. Uh, no, St. Peter and Judas. Judas, the famous character. This is from the scriptures, from Matthew. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented. It's the same word they're going to use for Peter. He repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. So Judas threw the silver into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. After he betrayed Jesus, he began to have, obviously, second thoughts uh, because um, he found out that Jesus was condemned to death. He might not have believed its betrayal would lead to his death. But whatever the case, whatever was going through his heart and his mind, Judas' repentance leads to anger and despair and to his hanging himself. He failed to understand or did not wish. That's what I think. I don't think he wished to embrace Jesus' teaching, which meant that he could ask for forgiveness and Jesus would forgive him even from the cross. He despaired the sin of Judas. And uh, scripture says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And on the same day, you had two men hanging on a tree, Jesus on the tree of the cross and Judas, two symbols of uh, humanity. And then you have Peter. Uh, like Judas, uh, he did something not quite nice. Uh, Peter denies three times that he was a disciple of Christ. He even swore that he did not know the man. I swear I don't even know him. And at that moment that he swore, a cock crows. Peter remembers what Jesus had said earlier, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and wept bitterly. Peter felt, like Judas, that he betrayed Jesus but unlike Judas, he was capable of true repentance. He wept out of love and would have a chance to redeem himself later. When did uh, Peter really have that chance in the Gospels to redeem himself? He denied him three times. When was he uh, redeemed, so to speak, in the eyes of Christ? When did Christ allow Peter to atone for that? Do you remember? Right. Three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter was hurt when he asked the third time. It goes back to this, and he says, Lord, you know that I love you, and feed my sheep. And so, uh, and then the scripture passage, of course, the Lord turned and looked at Peter at the moment the cock crowed. Can you imagine just, you know, and then you're looking right at the Lord, and he says, you just betrayed me. And, uh, but it's all part of God's plan for Peter. <laughs> And so as they led him away, this is a nice little factoid. I didn't know this. As they led him away, they seized Simon uh, from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made it carry it behind Jesus. And so Jesus got a little tired. Oh, I, would have, I wouldn't even made it through the scourging. <laughs> But uh, he got a little tired, and uh, so they, they grabbed, many times they uh, picture Simon from Cyrene as uh, a black man. And here's a factoid. Romans enlist Simon of Cyrene. Legally, a Roman soldier could press a person into service to carry a burden for the distance of one Roman mile. A soldier could do that to uh, one of the citizens of the lands they were occupying. <laughs> On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him 
two miles. And so I was thinking, you know, maybe Jesus was once asked to carry a load by the Romans. Maybe Jesus actually went one mile and he said, look, I'm going to go two miles with you. And, uh, but anyway, that's where that comes from. Interesting. And then, of course, uh, there's only one instance of Jesus speaking on the weight of the cross, and that is to the woman. That's the only time he speaks is to the woman, uh, as far as we know. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the, when they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Luke is the only one who records the words of Jesus on his way to the crucifixion. And this is uh, really, when you look at this passage, uh, Jesus is uh, predicting right away two things, I think. I think. He's uh, depicting the destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to be so bad. Uh, it, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, it was like the worst, worst suffering the Jews had ever gone through, ever. And uh, even more than the Holocaust in the sense that uh, in the Holocaust, many died, but Jerusalem, they were eating their own young. Uh, they were cannibalizing one another. And so he says, uh, the days are going to come when uh, you're going to say, uh, blessed are the barren, the wombs. That, and then he shifts from there, then, and he goes to the final coming, I believe. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That is, uh, those words are used uh, in the book of Revelation to uh, referring to the second coming of Christ. And so he, he predicts the destruction of Jerusalem, and then a little later, I think, uh, his second coming. Um, and then finally, when they reached the place called uh, Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. And so you remember the, uh, the fourth cup? Remember that last week? Uh, Father Mo was speaking about the fourth cup, and uh, there, there is a debate whether Jesus drank the fourth cup uh, somewhere along the way of his crucifixion, uh, or is he going to drink that fourth cup and consummate the sacrifice in the kingdom of heaven? Now, here's something that uh, is very, you should know, this is something I put in there. Uh, so he's offered the cup, he's offered something to drink twice during his crucifixion. This is the first time, this is from Matthew. Two occasions during Jesus' crucifixion when he was offered something to drink. It's not a minor detail, but part of the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If it were not important and a part of the gospel, it wouldn't be recorded for us. And this is a, a, a something I want you to uh, be aware of. There are many other things that we would like to know about the crucifixion that are not recorded. Uh, even John, at the end of his gospel, John says, Jesus did many, many other things. If we recorded everything he had done, it would, we'd have to fill up a whole library, John says. There wouldn't be enough books in the world to record everything Jesus did, John says. But these are written so that you might come to believe. And uh, so those things that are not included in Scripture, they're not there because they're not necessary for us to know. And so the things that are included are there because they are necessary, and that's the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. It's called the sufficiency of Scripture. That means that everything that's necessary for our salvation is recorded in Scripture, and by the same token, what is recorded is necessary. And so it's the Word of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything you need to know is right there. And you really need to know nothing more than that. Uh, although our human nature says we'd like to know. But those are what's necessary, and that's the uh, doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture. When they came to the place called the skull, and so uh, they crucified him, and so let's take a look at that. Uh, we, can, we do know some things. Uh, capital punishment, Roman style. Uh, it was reserved for the most heinous criminals who were, were non-Romans. 
primary purpose, to publicly shame the criminal. That was the primary purpose, was to shame the criminal. Uh, the condemned were scourged, stripped naked, and forced to carry the cross through uh, the town along public roadways. This was the practice. They were nailed for all to see, humiliated not only for his crime, but for his nakedness and derision uh, by the crowd. Uh, they were not given a burial. Sometimes, uh, if you go see the movie Risen, uh, this is exactly what happens. They just throw him into a pit. Uh, but uh, Jesus, uh, uh, the Roman soldier, the tribune in the, in the movie Risen, uh, uh, the prefect uh, was given a, a note by Nicodemus saying, we'd like to receive the body. And uh, that was unusual. And so he said, take the body. Usually they're just thrown into a pit. And uh, it also served as a deterrent uh, for rebels and runaway slaves. If, if you're thinking about doing this, this could be your future. You could be crucified. And what happens to uh, the uh, person on the cross? Sometimes they can last for uh, days. Uh, and eventually they die of asphyxiation or heart failure. Because as you know, they have to keep lifting themselves up. Uh, and if, if you can just imagine lifting yourself up with nails going through your feet, you know. It wasn't a pleasant thing to experience. And, uh, and so uh, that's why uh, if they needed to hurry up, they would break the legs of the condemned. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Jews said, look, the... the uh, the uh, the solemn Sabbath is coming. These men, you know, we have to get this over with. And so they broke the legs of the two criminals uh, precisely so that they would asphyx asphyxiate to death. So that's, uh, and so let's go through the uh, seven words of Jesus. You know, I, I just wanted to do this. Uh, the first word is Father. These are the first words of Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, St. John Chrysostom wrote beautifully about this. He, first he asks forgiveness for those who are, who are crucifying him and have condemned him. And then he even makes excuses for them. He asks forgiveness, and then he makes an excuse for them. They don't even know what they're doing. And uh, so this is Jesus. His first act is to forgive. Uh, on the cross, Pilate uh, put this... Uh, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews, and he wrote it in uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And it would have looked perhaps something like this. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and Jerusalem at the time of Passover was an international city. Uh, you had uh, Jews who spoke different languages coming all over the place uh, for the Passover. And so uh, those who were living in Jerusalem would have uh, been familiar with these three languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. But Pilate answered that fame, uh, what I have written, I have written. And so, uh, and Jesus uh never disclaimed that he wasn't a king, but he did say that his kingdom wasn't of this world. And so uh, here's an interesting picture. Uh, we're going to uh, the uh, second word of Jesus uh, is when he has this conversation with one of the criminals. And you see uh, this drawing. You, you, where's the, uh, the criminal on his left? He's in the dark. That's right, and it's meant to be that way. And it's interesting, if you go to, uh, I've been there, if you go to uh, Jerusalem and you go to the site of Golgotha, has anybody been there? Yeah, and did you put your hands in the holes where the crucifix were? Well, there are three holes, and uh, there's, a, there's a break in the uh, bedrock uh, right between Jesus and the criminal on the left. Uh, there's, a, there's a clear break in the bedrock, and when Jesus breathed his last, there was a mighty earthquake and, and lightning and thunder, and uh, people were going crazy. And as the earth quaked, uh, the, the, the bedrock literally split between him and the criminal on the left. Uh, there was a division. There was a separation. And uh, so Jesus, uh, he said, the criminal said, 
Jesus, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so uh, obviously the criminal on the left thought that Jesus was a king and that somehow his kingdom that Jesus, through his death, was going to enter into that kingdom. And that was enough for him to get, for Jesus to say, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So that's the second word of Jesus. And then, of course, the third word of Jesus uh, concerns uh, his mother and the apostle John. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. And uh, so the Catholic Church has written, and the saints have uh, contemplated much upon that exchange. And, uh, and this is where Mary becomes our mother in the order of grace. Uh, it, uh, she's uh, Jesus' mother uh, by nature, uh, but ours in the order of grace right there. And the fourth word of Jesus, uh, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sambaktani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, that is uh, Jesus, I believe, feeling the full weight of our sins. Uh, he is abandoned. He feels completely abandoned by his father. Uh, he feels totally alone. And uh, that's a cry from his heart. That's from his soul. Jesus had a human soul. He had a, a created soul. And uh, this cry comes from his soul. And then the fifth word is this. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. That's his fifth word. And then his sixth word is, is it is finished. Uh, and so this is where Jesus drinks. Many people think he, this is where he drinks the fourth cup. He drinks the wine. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. That's the fourth cup that many people believe. And it's John. When you read John, John just equivocates everything back to the Old Testament. And he tries to show how Jesus is fulfilling in his passion on the cross that which is written in the Old Testament. And of course, this is uh, uh, when Jesus uh, said, uh, my God, my God, why he's, he's, he's doing Psalm 22. And all of this uh, is uh, in uh, trying to show how Jesus is fulfilling the Passover sacrifice. He now becomes the Passover sacrifice. And so he drinks that fourth cup. He says, it's finished. It's done. I've done my, my duty. And then his final word, the seventh word, then Jesus, after he had said, it is finished, he, he called out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And uh, he, he, John simply says he handed over his spirit. Uh, this is from Luke. Uh, and, uh, and so what happened to Jesus when he handed over his spirit? Where did he go? We don't know exactly, but he went... He, he died and was buried. He descended into hell. Not the hell, but Sheol, uh, Hades. Uh, he goes down to where all the just are, and uh, to Abraham and, and Moses and, and Adam and Eve and uh, his, his father, Joseph. Uh, he goes to proclaim the gospel to them that it's finished, I've won, here it is. And when Jesus ascends into heaven, he doesn't go alone. Jesus doesn't go into heaven alone. He goes with all the saints. He opens up the gates of heaven for the saints. So he descended into hell. And all of this, of course, uh, Father Mo was speaking last week about uh, anamesis uh, or zikaron and uh, how when we celebrate the Eucharist, all of that is somehow mysteriously made present to us uh, when we celebrate the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the representation 
of the Paschal mystery of Christ. It is his death and resurrection uh, made present to us in our own time in a sacramental manner. And, uh, and so then we remember what happened after he died, uh, the veil of the temple. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. If you study this, if, uh, that's a very important uh, uh, inclusion within the Bible. The veil of the temple uh, separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the sanctuary. Uh, nobody could ever go into the veil of the temple except once a year the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement, and uh, that would be the high priest only. And now Jesus what, what this symbolizes, Jesus is our high priest who has entered into the veil, beyond the veil, and now that veil is removed, he has taken our humanity into the very throne room of God, where he intercedes for us as our high priest. And so at the moment of his death, that veil, which was very thick, they said, that was a thick veil, that was a, uh, that separated uh, the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies, it was just torn from top to bottom, whoosh, no problem for God, which shows that now that separation, that, that we now have access to the very throne of God. Through Christ, we as human, humanity have access to the very throne of God. We don't need that veil anymore. And uh, then, of course, uh, this goes back to that movie, Risen. Uh, it reminds me of that. But uh, you have the uh, centurion. In the, in the movie, you have a tribune. A centurion is a man who's in charge of a hundred men. The tribune is about a thousand. Uh, but here, the centurion, uh, according to Mark, when the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, the centurion was a man who uh, was obviously very, very familiar with death. Uh, and he probably, you know, this was probably not his first crucifixion. I mean, Pilate probably didn't put an inexperienced man in charge of this uh, king of the Jews, uh, especially when, you know, there was so much division within the city. He probably got a very experienced crew to crucify Jesus. And uh, so the centurion, you know, when he saw Jesus how he breathed his last, uh, first of all, he saw him forgive his enemies. Uh, and he probably, in other words, no, one's, no man has ever died like this man. That's what, this, and then for the last words, the last words of Jesus, Father, you know, no one's ever said that. You know, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. No one said that. And for him to see that, he said, he must have been the Son of God. And uh, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, in, it's interesting, if you go to Matthew's Gospel, it says, when the centurion and the men with him saw all that was happening, the earthquake, and, and so Matthew focuses his in on uh, the earthquake and the lightning and, the, and all of that, then they say together, truly, this man was the Son of God. But, and so uh, Mark focuses in on the death of Christ personally. Matthew focuses in on everything that's happening, and they say he must have been the Son of God. So you see, and, and so it's all of that. That's the sufficiency of Scripture. And so, uh, after he had died, uh, the two criminals were still alive, but the Sabbath was coming. And so when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, uh, they did not break his legs. Uh, they had done so to the others. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And John says, for these things took place, once again, that the scripture might be fulfilled. John is so adamant. When you read John, it's all about fulfilling the scripture. And what is that scripture? Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And, uh, and so in the Old Testament, the, the Passover lamb, if you remember last week, I think, or, or maybe you said it, uh, Hugo, uh, it, it, it was uh, forbidden to break any of the bones. The bones of the Passover lamb were not to be broken. And, uh, and so uh, it's interesting. The two men on his left and right, they have their legs breaking. Uh, but Jesus does not. None of his bones are broken. But he is pierced through the heart. And so they took the body of Jesus and uh, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices 
as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And of course, you know the story. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea owned that tomb. Uh, was it Joseph or Nicodemus? Joseph, Joseph yeah. And, uh, but here's an interesting uh, reflection. Um, the fall of humanity took place in a garden. And uh, death entered into humanity's, uh, death entered into the, into the history of humanity in a garden. And so John makes it clear, John's the only one who says there was a garden. No other, nobody else says there was a garden except John. See, John always brings it back to the Old Testament. And, uh, and so in a garden was a new tomb. And John says, that's interesting, it's not just a tomb, it's a new tomb. Why is it a new tomb? Because it's going to be the only tomb where someone's going to walk out of it. <laughs> and that's the new tomb. And so they lay Jesus in a new tomb in a garden because Jesus now is going to reverse the curse of death. And the tomb, where did the tomb make its appearance? In the garden. That's where the tomb made its appearance. That's where the tomb became a reality. You will die. And so now Jesus is going to arise in a garden from a new tomb. A new tomb where, which, which uh, is like when we go and we say the prayers over the grave. Uh, the sign of the grave, the grave now is a sign of hope that promises immortality. That's what we say at every uh, burial. The grave is a sign of hope. And so uh, it's a it's just an interesting little reflection uh, that Jesus is going to reverse the curse from that tomb in a garden. And so then uh, uh, you have Mary Magdalene and the Holy Woman uh, were the first to encounter Jesus. You know the story. Uh, all four Gospels speak about the woman going to the tomb, uh, each in a different little way, but it's the woman who go to the tomb. Uh, and they're the first ones... Uh, the, they were the first messengers of Christ's resurrection for the apostles themselves. Uh, the women become the apostle to the apostles. Uh, they were next to whom Jesus, uh, the apostles were the next ones to whom Jesus appeared, but first to the women. And, uh, and out of the twelve, he was uh, first appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And we see this uh, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, in the Acts of the Apostles. He has appeared to Simon, it says. Uh, Peter had been called to strengthen the faith of his brothers and, and, and so sees the risen one before them. It is on the basis of this testimony that the community exclaims, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And so Simon is always first, even in the resurrection uh, of the Apostles. Uh, of Christ. And um, so when you read the Gospels, uh, you know, in the Gospel of John, you have Mary Magdalene, the whole story of Mary Magdalene, and, uh, and she thought he was the gardener. And what was Adam's role? Adam was supposed to be a gardener. Uh, and so she thought he was the gardener. And, uh, and so, I mean, there's so many connections that you could put with the Old Testament and with the book of Genesis and the creation and fall of man. Jesus has come to reverse the fall of man. Uh, fulfilling the law and the prophets. Uh, this is what the apostles want to show, that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and he is the one whom they have been looking for, and that they all, all the Jews thought, well, what is the Messiah going to be like? He's going to be, you know, is he going to... Uh, uh, reconstitute the nation of Israel? Is he going to be a world leader? Is he going to have all the nations of the world under his foot? Uh, is he going to make the Jews great? Greater than Solomon? Greater than David? Uh, but uh, the apostles then have to show that Jesus is, through his death and resurrection, through his cross and resurrection, he has fulfilled the scriptures. They want to show the Jews that he is the Messiah, but not in the way you thought he was going to be. And so uh, Jesus himself took the twelve aside and he prophesies 
during his ministry, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man is going to be fulfilled. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to fulfill the scriptures as the Son of Man. He's telling that to his disciples. And then he even gets quite specific. He's going to be delivered over the Gentiles, Pontius Pilate. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. That's really specific, Jesus. And on the third day, he will rise again. And so Jesus is predicting even the details of what's going to happen to him. But the disciples did not understand any of this. None of the Jews really did. No one understood it. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. It wasn't in, as Peter said, God forbid that's not going to happen to you. It's not in our mind. This is not what the Messiah is supposed to happen. This is not what's supposed to happen to the Messiah. If you're the Messiah, this isn't supposed to happen to you. Uh, but that's exactly what's going to happen. And... Uh, Peter, also, after the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, his first homily, his first sermon, on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter uh, says to the people, his first, uh, this is the first time he speaks after, publicly, he says, we tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled that for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. And then he quotes the second psalm, you are my son today, I have become your father, or I have begotten you. And, uh, and so Peter now and the disciples, and now, and now with the help of the Holy Spirit and hindsight, and uh, they're going to begin to understand all that Jesus told them and why he had to suffer and, and undergo what he did. And so it's just beginning now, the, how it's, it's sinking in, so to speak. And of course, it sinks in first with the apostles as to what's, what happened to this man, and it had to happen, and, and it's all part of Scripture, all part of God's plan. And so we come to some awesome comparisons. A man has five vitamins in his bathroom. A toothbrush, razor, saving cream, bar of soap, and a towel from Motel 6. The average number of vitamins in a women's bathroom is 328. The average man would not be able to identify most of them. <laughs> Just a little comparison. <laughs> okay. Comparison with Adam. This is big in the Gospels. Uh, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since, uh, this is from Paul, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. We just spoke about that. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And so Christ has come to reverse the curse. The moment you touch it, the moment you eat of it, or even touch of it, Dying, you shall die. That's what the word is. Dying, you shall die. Uh, body, soul, you're going to die. And, and then that's going to be handed on to the rest of humanity. And, uh, but uh, God did not abandon us. God will come to reverse that curse. And now Jesus says, you have life. You have life. Adam was tempted by the devil and fell. Jesus was tempted by the devil but resisted. Adam disobeyed God. Jesus was perfectly obedient even to death. Adam brought sin and death to all mankind. Jesus saved all mankind from sin and death. Adam lost our place in paradise. Jesus restored our place in paradise. And then uh, there's a comparison uh, that this is all happens after the death and resurrection of Christ. These are when these comparisons begin to uh, take place. Uh, and early on in the church, uh, the flood was uh, going to become compared to baptism. Jesus said, uh, this is just before he ascends into heaven. This is after his death and resurrection. He says, go forth to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, baptism, the flood, uh, was a symbol of the purification of the world. Uh, we even say that in the baptismal rite. When we're baptizing a baby or an infant, when we bless the water, uh, we say, uh, through the flood you made an end to sin in the world. It, God destroyed sinful humanity in the flood. And so even in the rites that we use, those uh, connections are made. And there's going to be a new creation. And so comparison with Noah, uh, 40 days and 40 nights of rain prepare a new creation. 40 days and 40 nights of fasting and penance prepare our new creation. Creation begins with water. The creation literally begins with water. The new creation, by the way, you know, when you, th when you listen to uh, 
the evolutionary tale, the earth was a big molten blob. It begins with lava. But when you read creation, it begins with water. Uh, the new creation begins with water, uh, Noah. And our new creation begins with water, uh, baptism. And we just heard that this Sunday, Paul said, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Those are the exact words we heard this Sunday uh, from his letter. God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. God tells Noah and his family to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. God tells us to make disciples of all the nations, in other words, to fill the world with Christians. And then uh, there's some comparisons with Abraham. Uh, Jesus fulfills the promise to Abraham, and specifically in this way. Uh, I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And of course, Christ died for all people. Christ is the, uh, Christ is the, uh, the holy seed that comes from Abraham. Uh, uh, Abraham is the father of the Jews, and that's why when you read God, uh, the Matthew of Gospel, uh, Ma Matthew's Gospel that begins with the genealogy of Jesus, and Matthew takes you back to Abraham, and then through David up to Jesus to show that uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of uh, everything that Abraham, that God promised Abraham, uh, and He fulfills it for all people. Uh, Abraham, will all the families of the earth shall be blessed because of you, Abraham. And how are they going to be blessed? Because from you, Abraham, is going to come Jesus, who's going to die for everybody. And uh, so he frees us from bondage and sin, and he gives us the pledge of everlasting life and blessing us all. Uh, Jesus fulfills the covenant through Moses. The gospel writers continually focused uh, more than anybody on Moses on the connection between Moses and uh, Jesus Christ, who is the new Moses, and how he would lead a new exodus and establish a new law and covenant which fulfills and perfects the old law and covenant. And so, uh, of course, this is uh, we're going to go from the law to grace. So Moses versus Jesus. Ding, ding. <laughs> they were both... Born in the reign, Moses was born in the reign of a, a ruthless Pharaoh. Jesus was born in the reign of ruthless Herod. Uh, Moses escaped when Pharaoh ordered all the male children of the Hebrews killed. Jesus escaped when Herod ordered all the male children of Bethlehem killed. Moses passed through the waters of the Red Sea. Jesus passes through the waters of the Jordan in baptism. Moses and the Israelites were tested in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was tested in the wilderness for 40 days. Moses fasted for 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai. Jesus fasted for 40 days and nights in the desert. Uh, Moses' first sign was he changed water into blood. Jesus' first sign, according to John at Cana, he changed water into wine and then later wine into blood. Moses brought down the law from a mountain. Jesus taught the new law from a mountain, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you have heard it said, you shall not kill, but what I say to you. And so Jesus is perfecting the law. If you just look at your brother, if you get angry with your brother, you're breaking, you're, you're in a sense, killing him. Uh, Moses uh, gave Israel manna, well, God, uh, through Moses, gave Israel manna and water in the wilderness. Uh, Jesus gives all people true heavenly food and spiritual drink. Moses led Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Jesus leads all people out of bondage to sin and death. And uh, so these are some of the ways in which Jesus is the new Moses. And then you have the Passover lamb versus Jesus, the lamb of God. Uh, the lamb must be without blemish, we read. Yeah, we read in Exodus, and Jesus, as we know, was without sin. He was the perfect human being. The lambs were slaughtered beginning at the sixth hour of the day of preparation. And notice John, notice John. Jesus was handed over to be crucified at about the sixth hour of the day of preparation. John is adamant. He's, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy, even in he's the Passover lamb. No bones of the lamb could be broken, and John says once again, Jesus' bones were not broken, although the soldiers broke the bones of the other crucified criminals. A branch of hyssop was used for the sprinkling, the blood of the lamb, 
And John, once again, the sponge of sour wine was given to Jesus on a branch of hyssop. And uh, so Jesus, John's trying to say, Jesus is the new Passover lamb. He is our Passover lamb. And, uh, and then Jesus fulfills the promises to David. Uh, the kings of Israel, uh, God made a promise to David. It's called the Davidic Covenant. And he promised David that uh, from his own loins, a son uh, would one day rule on his throne. Uh, his kingdom would be firm, and it would endure as the sun and the moon, and it would last forever. And God would hit, give him dominion over all the nations. And David said, wow, this is great. And uh, so from that time on, all the kings of Israel were, a dis were supposed to be and were descendants of David. If you wanted to be the king of Israel, you had to be a direct descendant of David. Why? Because the Messiah, that was the Messianic covenant, the Messiah was to come from the line of David, the Davidic covenant, who was from the tribe of Judah. And so all the, if you look at the history of Israel, all the kings following David are descendants of David. They belong to his house. And, but you have some good kings and you have some bad kings, mostly bad kings. And... Uh, but it's an unconditional covenant, and eventually it's going to lead up to Joseph, who when the angel appears to him, he says, Joseph, son of David. Joseph should have been the king of Israel, but it was Herod, uh, because uh, there was a prophecy that if uh, the kings go bad, uh, Jesus says if the kings don't go bad, uh, the prophecy said that if, if your kings are always good, there'll always be a king on the throne. But if they don't go bad, if they, don't, if they aren't good and they're bad, uh, you're going to lose, uh, you won't always have a, a king of David on the throne. And that's what's happened. Herod was not from the lineage of David. He was uh, an Idumean, part Jew, part Idumean. And, uh, but, but Joseph was of the house of David. He should have been the king of Israel. But of course, uh, he had, God had better plans for him. And so uh, he had to be descended from David. Jesus was descended from David. He's going to be the fulfillment of the Davidic promise. Uh, all kings had to be anointed by Levitical priests. Uh, Je uh, Jesus was baptized by John, who was from the tribe of Levi. Uh, his mother was a, uh, from Levi. He was a priest. John was a priest. Uh, the Jews uh, at times were ruler of an international kingdom, and the Lord is going to be the Lord of all nations. Uh, the kings were paid homage by foreign princes. Jesus is paid homage by the Magi. Uh, um, David uh, was going to build the temple, and he did build it in Solomon. Solomon, his son, built it. Uh, Jesus is going to rebuild the temple of his body. Uh, God promised uh, to David an everlasting kingdom, and Jesus establishes truly an everlasting kingdom. And uh, so the Davidic promises, uh, this is the final thing here. Uh, there are secondary features, and one is very interesting. Uh, it has to do uh, with these two figures, uh, the Queen Mother, Mary. Uh, when you read, uh, there's an interesting uh, thing that uh, in, the, in uh, the Book of Kings where Solomon is now firmly established on his throne. And Solomon is the, is the king out of all the Old Testament kings uh, together with David. He's the one who's most like Christ. He's filled with wisdom. And Jesus even quotes uh, Solomon several times in Scripture. Uh, you have a greater one than Solomon here. He doesn't say any other king except Solomon. In other words, Solomon was a great king. And Jesus says, look, I'm even greater uh, than Solomon. And there's a wonderful passage in the book of uh, Kings where uh, you know who Solomon's mother was, right? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, and uh, she was the, right, the wife of Uriah. But anyway, uh, she uh, uh, gave birth to Solomon, raised Solomon, and, uh, she, and it was the mother who was the queen. It wasn't the wife. It was always the mother who was the queen uh, in the kingdom of Israel. And uh, there's a wonderful passage in the book of Kings where Solomon, once he's firmly established on his throne, his kingdom is peaceful. He is he is like a majestic king. Uh, the queen of Sheba goes to see him. Everybody goes to see him because of his wisdom. And in one of these passages, uh, his mother enters into the throne room 
And it says, literally, it says, the king, Solomon, the king stood up to greet his mother. He bowed to her. And then he ordered, and then he sat down on his throne. And then he orders a throne to be brought in for his mother. And it says that she sat down at his right hand. And then it says, the very next thing Bathsheba says uh, to Solomon, uh, the queen says to her son, the king, I have one small request to make of you, and I don't want you to refuse me. And the king said, make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you anything. And so this is uh, the queen mother in the Old Testament had great, great sway uh, with the king. Uh, and we see that in that little episode with Solomon and his mother. I won't refuse you anything. You're sitting at my right hand. Uh, here's a throne for you. And all of this is fulfilled in Mary, who is the queen mother of the church and of the kingdom of God. And of course, we know and we hope that she has great sway. And that's why we turn to her uh, to pray. And then also, uh, uh, there was a prime minister or chief steward. The kings of Israel had stewards who were in charge of the palace. They had the keys of the kingdom, so to speak. Uh, Eliakim, uh, in the book of Hezekiah, we see the story of Eliakim, uh, who replaces uh, uh, the chief steward, choose, uh, I forget his name. Uh, but Eliakim had, uh, was in charge of who enters and who doesn't enter into the palace and into the sanctuary. And, uh, and he was considered the prime minister or chief steward. And so Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of uh, heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so King uh, uh, Peter becomes the prime minister or chief steward of the church, uh, just as in the line of the Davidic line of kings, just as they had a chief steward, uh, Peter fills that role. And so these are the secondary features of the Davidic promises. And so you can see uh, this is just, and this just touches on, uh, you know, uh, there are so many other connections. There are so many other connections that if you read, you can, and that's part of the fun of reading the Gospels is is doing what the apostles did, looking back and saying, well, how does he fulfill this? You know, and uh, so that's that. And so I have some questions for you. Uh, number one, Peter and Judas are two examples of repentance. How have you experienced repentance like Peter and like Judas? Have you ever maybe despaired in some way of God's mercy? How have you encountered the crucified and risen Lord in your own life? How do you encounter him in a special way? And the women were the first to proclaim the resurrection to the apostles themselves. How do you proclaim the resurrected Christ to others? How do you do it? Amen. God bless you. Please